Barb, these clothes are amazing. Thank you. I should stop, but you know what? I'm gonna have a little bit more. <laughs> Do you want the recipe? They're really easy to make. Well, easy for you, maybe. <laughs> Gosh, you're really good at this. Are you sure these are regulation? Yeah, they're regulation. Hey, wouldn't it be nice if no matter where the dart hit, there was always a bullseye? That would be nice. It would be. In line with that thinking, I was wondering if you would want to uh, accom accompany me or to jo join to a what? <laughs> you would if you want to um, th throw more darts in the board. Yeah, just ninth time's a charm, right, Barry? You'll see. So what are you doing for Easter? Do you have any plans? You know what? We don't have any plans yet. Uh, we'll probably wind up at my mom's in the afternoon, you know, which Greg will love. <laughs> well, hey, why don't you come to church with us in the morning? It's going to be a great service. There's some people there I'd love for you to meet. Ooh! Oh, what's up? What's up? Oh, he's, sorry. He's, he's, he's fine. He, you missed him completely. Gosh, I haven't seen him run that fast in, like, I think ever. I apologize. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's <sighs> fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Look, do you want to come with me to Chush? Do you, do you want to come with me to Churros? Churros? Do you, yeah. Did you yeah. say, do you want to come with me to get churros? Yeah. Like the baseball game. All right. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I haven't been to church since I was a kid. I promise. You'll fit right in. You think? <laughs> of course. I know, it can be kind of intimidating when you walk in and you don't know what to expect. But trust me, it's worth it. Do you think we could sit together? Well, hey, how about this? Why don't we just swing by in the morning and pick you up? Are you okay, man? You like fishing. You like fishing. Yeah, I do. You know, you could be uh, a fisher of men. Actually, that sounds really nice. I think we'll go. Oh, great. You're going to be so glad you came. Great, just relax. You seemed a little stressed out. Hey, why don't you come to church this Sunday with me and my family? I think you could use it. That's what, yeah, that's what I've been trying to say. It's funny, but yet it's not. You know, sharing our faith should be as easy as having a conversation. Just like you're having a conversation about your favorite sport team or your grandchildren, like Pastor Rick has talked about. But for many of us, it's a struggle. It really is. You know, two weeks ago, Pastor Conrad, as we started this conversational Christianity sermon series, he talked about the fact that making our faith story should easily fit into our daily conversations. As you saw, the two women were on that video. It was very easy for her. It was very fluid. But of course, it wasn't the same for the gentleman. But it should be that way for us. And again, he took away the, the pressure from us when Pastor said that it's not really you know, up to us necessarily to take them to that salvation prayer. It may not be ready. Let's just present them the gospel. Let's plant the seeds, because that's what his sermon was about, was scattering seeds, and then leave the rest to the Holy Spirit. And so last week, Tom did a great job about telling your story as a means of evangelism, and the fact that our testimony is a powerful tool in spreading the good news of the gospel. People can argue with you about politics or even religion, but they can't argue with you about your own testimony, about what God did in your life. And so Tom did a great job of explaining that to us, and it was powerful. Today, I'm going to talk about creating Matthew opportunities. Another word for it is Matthew parties. You know, and I don't know if it's just by coincidence that I get the party one, if it has something to do with my past, or that I'm an expert on partying, but that's what I'm going to talk about today. Creating Matthew opportunities, again, as a way of bring, bridging the gap between believers and non-believers in a common setting. And then in that context, we let the Holy Spirit expose our non-believing friends to the person of Jesus Christ. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand. 
and we will bring a Bible to you. Raise your hand, keep it high. Somebody will bring you the Bible. When you get the Bible, turn to Luke chapter 5, and we're going to be going through verses 27 through 32 this morning. But as they're passing out the Bibles, today we live in a culture that is rapidly becoming faceless. Faceless. If you look at social media and all the ways that we have to communicate with each other today, whether it's cell phones, emails, texting, Twitter, Facebook, online banking, now we can do all our shopping online, even grocery shopping now is becoming an online thing. But all of these things are symptoms. They're telling symptoms of a society, our society, that is set up to eliminate personal relationships. You know, we don't have to communicate with each other. I can just text somebody. And so it's taken away that, that personal touch. If you look at a millennial family nowadays in a restaurant, this is more often what you will see. Everybody sitting at the table looking at their cell phones, right? They're not conversing with each other, not building relationships. I know it's a struggle for me and my wife when our grandkids are around as our kids. It's like, put the phone away. Let's have a conversation. And, but this is the culture in which we live in today. And the church isn't excluded from this. In the, la- in the days of the mega church we live in, their intimate personal relationship is becoming a legend. You know, you can be there and, and have been going there for a long time and nobody knows you because the church is so big. You're losing any ability to build relationships with other people in the congregation. Now we have TV church, TV evangelists, and a lot of people stay at home even. Do church at home. And now we have drive-through churches where you can go and drive through and get a sermonette. You can get a prayer or whatever. But again, you're not building relationships with anybody. It's been noted that in churches above 500 people, 50% of the church usually arrives to a Sunday morning service 10 minutes late, usually during the second song. And the same 50% of those congregations are known to leave with roughly within five minutes after the service is over. Does that look like anybody you know, or does that look like you? People are reluctant to linger and invest in relationships. Here at Community Church, we strive to build relationships to the best of our ability. We're a congregation of well over 600, and it's hard. It's not easy to remember every name, know every family, know the names of your kids, but we try. We strive to do that because we believe that relationship is the key to bringing people to Christ and the key to growing the church, as you'll see in this sermon today. But regardless of their behavior or even verbal claims, people are in need of relationship. They are. This faceless society has left people craving for personable interaction where they're known and where they know others. And interestingly enough, most people are overtly responsive to an invitation for relationship. And in regards to people coming to church, statistics show that 82% of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend church if they're invited. A lot of people, most people that you talk to that maybe don't go to church, if you ask them why, they say, I've never been invited. I've never been invited. So people are craving for this, though, and they're hungry for it. And But those same studies that I just quoted show that only 2% of church members invite an unchurched person to church. 98% of churchgoers never extend an invitation to an unchurched person, 98%. A Lifeway research study, including more than 15,000 adults, revealed that about two-thirds, or 66%, are willing to receive information about a local church from a family member. 56% are willing to receive uh, an invitation from a friend or neighbor. The message is clear to us this morning that the unchurched are open to conversations about church. You know, we're on this move to have the Easter service up at the college, and we're going to make a big deal out of it. We really are. And that's why we have those invitation cards out there. Give them to your friends. Again, if most people don't come to church because they've never been invited, this is an opportunity to invite them. It really is. It's a non-threatening place. Now, when we use the terms conversational Christianity, And the one I'm going to introduce to you this morning, 
Matthew opportunity evangelism or Matthew parties, the first thing that comes to some people's minds is seeker-friendly. Seeker-friendly is becoming a negative connotation in the church world because for some, they believe that it means that we water down the gospel. We're not teaching the whole truth of God. But I want you to hear me this morning. The means by which we attract people to the church has nothing to do with the gospel in which we proclaim. There are two separate issues. We should exhaust ourselves looking for every opportunity to invite people to the body of Christ, invite people to church. But yet we will preach the word in its entirety. We will preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. And so, again, there are many ways in which to attract people to the church, to the kingdom, and we should be all about that. This morning, I want to talk about Matthew, the Apostle Matthew, and there's really not a whole lot said about him. There's a few verses that we're going to go over this morning, so let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 5, 27 through 32 says this, later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in his tax collector booth. Come, be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And soon Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests were there. But the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink, drink with such scum? They said. And Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call sinners to turn from their sins, not to spend my time with those who think they are already good enough. In this text today, we see Matthew, a tax collector, sitting in his booth. He's collecting taxes when this man Jesus happens by and invites him to be one of his disciples, one of his followers. Now, we must understand that of all the people that Jesus could have invited, Matthew might be one of the least likely. As a Jew, he's a tax collector. In this Roman-occupied Judea, these men were thoroughly despised by the Jews because they were cooperating with the Roman occupiers against their own people. In other words, he was a traitor. He was ripping off his own people, stuffing his own pockets, and getting rich by extorting high markups on the taxes that they charged. It may be hard for us to think of a parallel in our society, except maybe somebody like a crooked politician or a crooked lawyer, someone who seeks to make money off someone else's pain, ambulance chasers, we might call them. So why would Jesus reach out to somebody who worked in such a despised profession, like a first century tax collector? In our day, why would Jesus reach out to a crook, a criminal, a prostitute, somebody that lives on the fringe of society. And I think you know the answer. The answer is love, because he loved us. Romans 5.8 says this, For God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. We weren't deserving of it. We had not lived properly up to that point so to, to get him to accept us. We were still sinners when Christ died on that cross for us and accepted us into his family. This morning, you and I are Matthew. We're Matthews. We are the first century tax collectors who deserve prejudice and loathing from our fellow human beings. We deserve wrath and condemnation from God. But in spite of all of that, despite of our shortcomings, and trust me, I have many, it was love that moved the Father to send the Son to save you and I. It was love that moved the Son to wrap himself in human flesh and live this perfect life and then suffer and die for all the sin on the cross. And then he rose from the dead to declare victory over sin, death, and the devil. It was love that moved the Holy Spirit to plant a seed in faith, a faith in your heart through the Word. And it was love that moved the Spirit to water and to nourish that faith seed so that it would grow and mature. It is love that moves the Spirit to lead, guide, and direct you in new life that Jesus gives you. So, Matthews, all of you this morning, now that you have been saved by God, will you join with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit to reach out to others 
to be his hands, to be his arms, to embrace those around you with the saving love of Jesus Christ. Will you do that this morning? One ways in which to do that, and we're going to talk about this morning, one way to reach out to your friends, your co-workers, or your neighbors with this saving love is something that's called Matthew parties. Matthew opportunities. That's what Matthew did, is he threw a party. This is the approach that he used. Verse 529, it says that he invited all his tax collectors' friends who were far from God. And then he made Jesus the guest of honor at this party with some of his followers. All of this Matthew did in hope that good things would happen when these two groups got together. It's as simple as that. Bring unbelievers and believers in the same room and watch what the Holy Spirit can do. Amen? Because God can do these things. It was not that hard. It wasn't that big of a stretch. But Matthew figured, I've got to try that. And again, it's by having these Matthew parties. He threw this banquet, and he invited his tax collector friends, again, who were far away from God, and he made Jesus this guest of honor. It's something that you and I can still do today to reach out to the non-churched. Now, these social events that I'm talking about are designed to mix members, again, of the churched with the unchurched, believers with non-believers. They're designed to provide a neutral setting Again, where a contagious Christian can make low-key contact with non-Christian friends in a non-threatening manner. These are ideal environments for, one, strengthening relationships you already have. When we talk about the unbeliever, it could be your best friend. It really could. And your relationship is good, but yet he has still not become a believer. So you can encourage that relationship, continue to build that relationship, as well as making new relationships, cultivating new ones with non-believers that you've invited. And they're great places to plant some spiritual seeds, strike up conversations about faith, and the wheels may just start turning. And over time, it will result in a whole new eternity for many of the people you invited. What was really just a non-threatening social gathering could make the difference for somebody where they spend eternity somebody you love, somebody you care about. But you sit here this morning, and you may be asking yourself, why? Why would I do that? Why would I want to do something like this? It's not comfortable. It's not easy for me. I'm good. I've got my ticket to heaven. I know where I'm going. Why would I care about my neighbors enough to step out of my comfort zone and do something like this? One answer would be love. Because God loves them. And I pray because you love them. Another reason might be because somebody did it for you. Somebody loves Steve enough to speak into his life. And I would say that most of you are here today because somebody spoke into your life. And they loved on you. But another reason is because God has commanded us to. Mark 12, 29-31, Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second, he says, is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. That one commandment sums up the Ten Commandments all together, all in one. So this morning, I want to take a look at Matthew for just a moment and see what was going on in his mind that caused him to decide to reach out to his friends. And although these verses that talk about this, this moment in time are very short and don't describe a whole lot, I think you can read into a, a lot of this what Matthew was thinking, what his heart was doing, what must that have been like for him to decide to do this. And I think many of us here this morning might know exactly what that feels like, being a despised person, being embraced by Jesus and his disciples. In a moment, Matthew went from being despised and rejected to being one of the disciples. I mean, it, like that. Jesus walks by and says, Levi, follow me. 
And in that moment, when he walked away from everything and followed Jesus, he now became part of Jesus' inner circle. He was one of the 12. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. But Jesus gave it to him in a moment. He was, again, not that despised and rejected person anymore. When Jesus called Matthew to follow, Matthew walked away from everything. Everything he had known up to that point. His identity, his comfortable routine, his lucrative business, and his friends. And as he interacts with the other disciples, he's amazed. He's amazed that they accept him, that they love him in spite of his past. And so again, in a moment, he has a whole new set of friends. He has this new life. That's what excites me about Honor Bound on Monday nights. Man, if you're not going to that, come and join us. Because that's what this looks like. I have men that are from law enforcement backgrounds. I have men that are from broken lives, from drug addiction, from gangs, from whatever walk of life. We have people from different social backgrounds. But yet when they come together, they are one. They are loving on one another. They're confessing sins. And for me, when a man confesses sins in front of other men, that is special. That is special because that tells me they trust one another. They've built those kind of relationships where they can feel loved and accepted and not judged. But that's what Matthew is feeling. Here he is. He's walking with Jesus. But there's one thing that bothers him. As much as his life has changed, is excited about what he's doing and what God's doing in his life, he cannot get off of his mind his friends, those that he has walked away from. He wonders what they think about all this as they see him walking with Jesus. He just left them, left his business. And he wonders in his mind, did they see me standing by Jesus as he taught? Do they know I'm on his side now? And as he pondered these things, more questions plagued Matthew. I'm experiencing something truly amazing, and I have all these amazing new friends, and I have this assurance of heaven when my life ends. That's great news. But what about my friends? What about my tax collector buddies? They have no clue what this new life is about. How can I tell them? What can I possibly say or do to provide some sort of bridge between them and this man, Jesus, who changed my life. And Matthew, in his mind, he sees his friends one by one, the very friends that he's lived with most of his young life, the same guys who, as of yet, have no hope of heaven. And all of a sudden, an idea comes into Matthew's head. I know. I know what I can do. I can throw a banquet and I'll invite my old friends, and I'll also invite Jesus and, and my new friends and make him the guest of honor, and I'll just see what happens by putting those two groups in the same room. And what if my new friends, what if my Christian friends don't just stand there and huddle up together like we tend to do at times, but they walk across the room they come out of their, step out of their comfort zone and they engage his old friends. They engage him in conversation. What if something like that were to happen? And then what if the Holy Spirit came down in that room? Maybe some spiritual sparks would get ignited. Maybe, just maybe, some of my old buddies will wind up in the kingdom like I did, all because of a party. All because of a party. So Matthew puts his plan into action. He invites his friends, and then he invites Jesus. And although the word doesn't say what transpired at that party, you can only imagine that something divine happened because the divine was in their presence, in the person of Jesus Christ. And the power of Matthew's story this morning is amazing. One guy who is committed to selfish living is unexpectedly invited to join God's family. His response is to leave everything immediately, and begin living this new life. And as he gets to know Jesus, and he gets to know the other disciples, he's utterly enamored by Jesus and, that, and those other men. And he develops these friendships with all of them. And he's no doubt overdosing on joyous Christian fellowship. In short, he finds this new little community of men and women to be the best thing he's ever experienced. But there's just one problem again. 
What's he going to do about his former friends? He can either hide and he can ditch his old friends, or he can choose to live to the grander vision by getting all over the work of bridging the gap. You know, I'm impressed by Angel, a young man in our congregation that came to Christ not too long ago. And as I watch him now bridging the gap by bringing men to honor bound, by bringing men to, to, to church, by I see him mentoring men down at Taco Bell or wherever he happens to be. Angel, I'm proud of you, brother, because you're doing exactly what we're talking about this morning. You are bridging that gap. And it's exciting. <laughs> Amen. And that's what Matthew felt. Matthew said, I want to help my friends, my far from God friends. And he could have given up. He could have said, I'm stuck, Lord. I, I think maybe it's just the best thing if I just walk away and I'll let fate take its course. But he didn't. He didn't. Fortunately, with eternity hanging in the balance for his friends, Matthew faithfully found a way to get his friends introduced to the living Christ. So exactly what is a Matthew party? What is a Matthew opportunity? It's a get-together with the purpose of getting to know those around you and in love, introducing them to Jesus. It doesn't have to be anything special. It could be something very simple. The invitation list should consist of both people who are still far from God as well as people who are Christ followers. Remember, Matthew invited his lost friends, but he also invited Jesus too. So the bottom line is, in our culture today, being Jesus is ascended and he sits at the right hand of the Father, when you invite your Christian friends, guess who comes? Jesus. Because he indwells his children. So when you bring those two groups together, things happen. The Holy Spirit shows up. And like what Pastor Conrad shared with us a couple weeks ago, it doesn't have to end in a prayer for salvation. Just plant some seeds. Just scatter some seeds. It's all about pulling believers, non-believers in the same room and trusting God with the results. So what kind of parties are there? What kind of opportunities do you have to reach the lost? Meal, share a meal with somebody. Invite them over to your house for a dinner and invite several couples, believers and non-believers, very non-threatening. Sporting events, not too long ago we did the national championship game right here. We had 50 people show up. A lot of them didn't go to our church, but they heard we were showing the game. So guess what? They come in and they fellowship with, uh, with believers. And leave the rest to God. Let the seeds be planted. Movie nights, block parties, sporting events, ba barbecues, whatever you can do to bring again believers and non-believers together. Matthew parties don't have to be formal or expensive or elaborate or perfectly orchestrated, they just have to happen. They just have to happen, it's that simple. So this morning, points to consider. What types of opportunities do you have to bring together believers and non-believers? What types of opportunities do you have? I'm excited for Mike and Cody Schuster as they start this young couples ministry, young family ministry, because their brain's already turning. They already knew who, knew, know who they're inviting. They've already got a list. They're working it. They're inviting their friends and their neighbors. And it is exciting because I know what the Holy Spirit can do. I know what Jesus can do. At this party or event, make sure your Christ followers are outnumbered, okay? So that those who are far from Christ don't feel ganged up on. Don't invite 12 Christians and one non-Christian. That could be a little intimidating and a little uncomfortable, right? Don't do that. Number three is try to decide which Christ followers would be best for those on your invitation list. Like-minded people. Think about their age, their stage in life, their interests, their temperament. If they're young family, you probably want to invite other young families so they have something in common to talk about. And number four is follow up with those who you invite. Did they enjoy themselves? Would they like to come and participate in maybe other things that you do? But it's that simple. Remember, the goal, is always to, the goal is to always, in love, point them to Jesus. Amen? 